Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this particular series is entitled Life Everlasting on Death, Dying, and the Future Hope. And this lesson is lesson number six in that series for November 5 of 2022, entitled He Died for Us. Hmm. That should be important for Christians, right? As usual, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Father, we have come today to talk about some of the most important issues in the entire history of our universe. We, we realize that you've gone to an enormous lengths to make it possible for sinners to be convinced to come back to you and rejoin your kingdom and also in order to do that, you've had to deal with all the accusations and questions of Satan. Be with us as we discuss some of those issues today that they may be clear in the minds of those who are listening is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. The first death, which unfortunately we are all very familiar with, can ult cannot ultimately be avoided on this earth. The righteous and the wicked alike all die that, le that death unless Jesus comes again before that time. Paul made uh, a comment about that. 1 Corinthians 15, 17 to 19. Can you read that for us, Jim? And if Christ has not been raised, then, our f then your faith is a delusion and you will st are still lost in your sins. It would also mean that the believers in Christ who have died are lost. If our hope in Christ is good for this life only and no more, then we deserve more pity than anyone else in all the world. American Bible Society. Okay, so what do you think? Does being a Christian in this life make us worthy of pity? I have a friend who had a, went to a, a university where there was a lot of people who were very skeptical about Christianity. And he got into quite a few discussions with somebody who thought that, you know, you Christians are just crazy. Think of all the good things that you're missing out on. And this guy had been through all that kind of stuff when he was younger. And he said, look, I've been through all that stuff. I wouldn't go back to it for any way, anything. My life as a Christian is the best, is the best thing I could possibly, best way I could possibly live today. And I've chosen it on purpose. And, and the other guy, there was nothing more he could say. Well, do you wish that there was some way that you could live a life like a worldling and still go to heaven? There are a lot of people who seem to think that way. The life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ makes it possible for us, by following his example, to also be resurrected from the dead. Think of all he went through to make that possible for us. There are many Christians who believe that the only reason for Jesus Christ to have come to this world was to pay the price or sin. Is that true or not true? That's what they say. He shed his blood for us. That's what they say, but it's not true. Well, if you include all that's, that's connected with sin, if you, if you include in that, okay, God, Jesus Christ is going to eliminate everything to do with sin, maybe it's true. Is that why he came? Did Jesus need to pay the price for sin to, to benefit the onlooking universe? Who did he pay? Yeah. However, other Bible students give a totally different reason for why Jesus came to this earth and died. We will look at both viewpoints. The onlooking universe uh, never sinned. Did his life and his death do anything for them, the angels and others? What, what, what has the death of Christ done for us? We also need to focus on what it means when, when we, could, we could spend the afternoon discussing what Jesus has done for us if we wanted to. We also need to focus on what it means when we say that the great controversy between God and Satan over God's government and character involves the entire universe. Did the life and death of Jesus Christ impact the universe in any way? To begin our research in trying to answer that question, we need to look at a number of passages in the Bible which talk about God's planning for our world. Carrie, Jim? Which one is? Carrie. Okay. Carrie? 
reading from Revelation chapter 13, verse 8. All people living on earth will worship it, the beast, except those whose names were written before the creation of the world in the book of the living, which belongs to the lamb that was killed. From the Good News Bible. Yeah, and there's a couple of other places where, well, there are other places in the Bible where that idea is suggested. Especially, I want us to note Titus 1, 1 and 2. The truth taught by our religion, which is based on the hope for eternal life. God does not lie, promise, does not lie, promised us life before the beginning of time. It's from the okay. writings of Ellen G. White. Okay. That, that was from the, the Bi next Good passage. News Bible. Oh, I'm sorry. The next is from the Bible, the from the Ellen G. White, from Desire of Ages. The plan for our redemption was not an afterthought, it, a plan formulated after the fall of Adam. It was an unfolding of the principles that from eternal ages have been the foundation of God's throne. And what are those principles? What principle is God's government founded upon? Love. And what's the principles of Satan's idea, throne and, and government and so forth? Selfishness. Selfishness. Those two are completely incompatible. The great controversy which started in heaven has been played out on this planet. When God created Adam and Eve, he had obviously already made a plan for what he would do in case they succumbed to Satan's temptations. Our tiny world was certainly not the first place in the universe where God created beings to live. Even before, and th those beings are mentioned in Job 1 and 2, aren't they? Even before they were created, did he make plans to rescue every other group of people that he created in case they chose to rebel? Did God just know that somebody was going to try something at some Did point? Did God have a plan of salvation for Lucifer and those who fell from heaven? Well, uh, if we're going to accept everything that Ellen White says, she says that several times God called councils in heaven. He was ready to accept Lucifer back if he would, if we, if he would be willing to give up his ideas and come back to the place where so yes, there if was he would that. Really change. If it would really Lucifer change. It would really change. Yep. Yeah. So human beings are a unique order of beings. No one, in the, uh, no one else in the universe is exactly like us. Did God make us with the ability to produce children in our own image, at least partially, to teach us about the challenges of God's dealing with us humans? Yeah, I've just spent a couple of weeks with my children, my son, and his family, my granddaughters, you learn a lot about your own experiences and so forth when you do that. Satan does not have the ability to procreate, and aren't you thankful? None of the angels do either. Were we created partially to answer Satan's accusations against God in the great controversy? Absolutely. Ellen White wrote, all heaven took a deep and joyful interest in the creation of the world and of man. Human beings were a new and distinct order. They were made in the image of God. So in other words, we have the ability to procreate. It was the Creator's design that they should populate the earth. So instead of making a million angels or, or five million angels and putting them here on this earth, He gave, gave us Adam and Eve with the ability to procreate. They were to live in close communion with heaven, receiving power from the source of all power, Upheld by God, they were to live sinless lives. Ellen White wrote that in 1902 in the Review and Herald. Starting at the gates of the Garden of Eden after they sinned, men and women were encouraged to sacrifice animals as an atonement for their sins. Theologians have called that a substitutionary sacrifice. What does that mean? Well, we'll talk more about that as we move along. We need to understand that those sacrifices were intended to teach at least two very important things. One, sin leads to death, even the death of innocent victims in some cases. I mean, why did Jesus have to die? Because of sin. Two, that someday God would send his own son to give us a full and complete picture of what that implies. Okay. Gordon, I think that's yours. From the Bible study guide for Sunday, 
Animal sacrifices are gruesome and bloody, that is true. But why is this gruesomeness and bloodiness precisely the point? Teaching us that about Christ's death in our place and about the terrible cost of sin, terrible cost of sin was? Yeah, from my Bible study guide. God was trying to teach his children how serious sin is. Remember Romans 6.23, sin pays its wage death, and yet we are all involved in it. So we all are supposed to do what? We're all supposed to die. As far as we know, the, that first animal sacrifice that God directed Adam and Eve to perform was the very first death of anything in the entire universe. Adam and Eve were to be repulsed by that sacrifice and thus also to be repulsed by the very idea of rebellion and sin against God. That's what they were supposed to have learned. Starting with his interview with Nicodemus what, during... What, yeah? what people down through the ages learned is that if you have enough money to buy sheep, then you can keep on sinning. Yeah, the idea is... If you is buy well, enough sheep to sacrifice, well, keep on sinning. Yeah. Well, I well, take exception to earlier on we said uh, atonement. Jesus' death was not an atonement. It was a teaching process, uh, mm -hmm. exercise. Well, yeah. but that is atonement if you realize that atonement is an atonement. It's a reconciliation. But the problem a, is that term is, is not yeah. being understood as atonement. Yeah, that's it was, true. It was a, as an a appeasement. Uh, it was a pagan not, exercise. Yeah, not that. And it's been that way for thousands of years. Yeah. Oh, we've gotten numb to death. Yeah. Of course. Jesus began to teach us as human beings that he would eventually have to be sacrificed and die, even be crucified. Uh, Jim, I guess that's Matthew 16. Matthew 16, verses 21 and to 23. From that time on, Jesus began to say plainly to his disciples, I must go to Jerusalem and suffer much from the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, I will be put to death, but three days later I will be raised to life. Let me interrupt a little bit there. In the ministry, in the life of, of Jesus, in the ministry of Jesus, the first six months he was, of course, baptized. He had the 40 days of, of uh, the temptations out in the wilderness. He went to the wedding up back in Cana. And then we don't know much about what happened in the rest of those. And then the next year, from the, from the, then came the first Passover, and at that first Passover, he cleansed the temple for the first time. A year went by. During that year, he worked mostly among, around Judea, under the radar to try to not to cause too much friction with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And most of that time is recorded in John. Yes, we have a, we have a little bit little of that. Tidbits. A little tidbits of it recorded in John. Then the next year was his time, and of course then it got so bad in Galilee, they wanted to arrest him. So Jesus moved, I mean in Judea. So then he moved to Galilee, and the three other uh, Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, primarily focus on that next year, which he spent in Galilee. But then things got so bad there, that he went outside of Jewish territory completely, he said, and he took his disciples, he said, I need a period of time when I can really teach my disciples what they need to know before, before I'm gone. And it was during that time that we read uh, what Jim is now reading to us. 22? Verse 22, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. God forbid it, the Lord, God forbid it, Lord, he said, that must never happen to you. Verse 23, Jesus turned around and said to Peter, get away from me, Satan. You are an obstacle in my way because these thoughts of yours don't come from God, but from human nature. Good news Bible. And where do we know that they ultimately come from? Satan. Satan. Yeah. Luke 18, 31 to 34. And let me interrupt again. That Luke 18 experience, the children, the, the people who lived in Galilee needed to come down at least once a year to a Passover or to one of the major festivals in Jerusalem. That was considered essential. And when they did, they would travel in large groups. They would cross the Jordan up 
at the base of the Sea of Galilee. They would travel around down to Perea so they didn't have to go through Samaritan territory. They would cross the Jordan River again around, down near Jericho, and then they would climb up to Jerusalem. And on that journey up to Jerusalem, Jesus is making these comments. Now, he's, he's on his final journey to Jerusalem. He's getting ready for what we, what we know happened when he got to Jerusalem. And this is what he said to them. On their way to Jerusalem for the final Passover of Jesus' ministry, Jesus took the twelve disciples aside and said to them, Listen, we are going to Jerusalem where everything the prophets wrote about the Son of Man will come true. He will be handed over to the Gentiles, who will mock him, insult him, and spit on him. They will whip him and kill him. But three days later he will rise to life. But the disciples did not understand any of these things. The meaning of the words were hidden was hid the meanings of the words was hidden from them and they did not know what Jesus was talking about, the Good News Bible. Now again, let's notice that uh, more and more people have, be, have come to realize all the things that Jesus could do. I mean, he could feed thousands of people. He could heal sickness. I mean, this is the king we want for our nation. He will help us to conquer the Romans. And so in that great crowd of people that was traveling there together up toward Jerusalem, they were certain that when they got to Jerusalem, they would be anointing Jesus to be the next king of the Jews. They couldn't, they couldn't understand at all what Jesus was saying. Jesus talked about going up there and being handed over to the Gentiles and dying. Huh? huh? What are you talking about? It was totally contradictory to their worldview, their paradigm. Absolutely. That, that, you know, that they would be freed from Roman, Roman well, tyranny. Well, he healed all these people and done all these miracles. Yeah. Uh, if we could just direct him in the right way. Yeah, we could just well, get him to do what we want him yeah. to do. Everything would be great. Yeah. Let's put, put the John 18:37 there at the end of uh, paragraph 10. Yeah. Was Jesus born only for the purpose of dying? We're now coming back to that question. Ellen White has some interesting things to say there. His whole life was a preface to his death on the cross. What do we mean when we say a preface? But in John 18, 37, Jesus says his purpose was to, his purp why he was born was to bear witness to the truth. Mm -hmm. And those that were of the truth listened to him. Yeah. We need to see the much larger picture presented by Ellen White that we now call the Great Controversy in order to understand, to fully understand the life and death of Jesus. That life of Jesus has given us a choice. And I want you to think about this. One, we can choose to live a life as much as possible like the life of Jesus, our example. Or two, we will die the death that Jesus died. And that's what we're talking about this week. The death that Jesus died, separated by our sins from God, the only source of life. So live his life or die his death. By his life and his death, Jesus answered all the questions and accusations leveled against God in the Great Controversy. That was the only way in which God could win the Great Controversy. If there had been some other less expensive way, God would certainly have chosen it. Thus it was essential for Jesus Christ to do what he did to eliminate all the arguments against God and his government. Without that, trust in God's government risked being destroyed by Satan's attacks, and there would have been no way in which we could be saved. That is the ultimate meaning of a substitutionary. He died to make it safe for the entire universe by eliminating Satan and his arguments and all, that, all, all aspects of sin, and so it became safe for us too. Carrie? This is from Mrs. White. But the plan of redemption had a yet broader and deeper purpose than the salvation of man. It was not for this alone that Christ came to the earth. It was not merely that the inhabitants of this little world might regard the law of God as it should be regarded, but it was to vindicate the character of God before the universe. To this result of his great sacrifice, 
its influence upon the intelligences of other worlds as well as upon man, the Savior looked forward when just before his crucifixion he said, Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all unto me. John 12, 31, 32. The act of Christ in dying for the salvation of man would only make heaven accessible to men, but before all the universe it would justify God and his Son in their dealing with the rebellion of Satan. It would establish the perpetuity of the law of God and would reveal the nature and results of sin. From Mrs. White, Patriarchs and Prophets. Now, those of you who read the King James Version, bless you, you know that in John 31 and 32 it says, God, uh, I will draw all men unto me. And, but you notice that men is in italics. So what does italics mean in the King James Version? It's not there for emphasis. It's there for, it's because it, it was supplied by the translators. They didn't know about the great controversy. Ellen White did. So, um, by coming to, oh, I'm sorry, Care, um, Myra? By coming to dwell with us, Jesus was to reveal God both to men and to angels. Not alone for his earthborn children was this revelation given. Our little world is the lesson book for the universe. God's wonderful purpose of grace, the mystery of his redeeming love, is the theme unto which angels desire to look. That's in 1 Peter 1, verse 12. 12. And it will be the study of throughout endless ages, from Desire of Ages. Okay, Gordon? And also from the Desire of Ages, page five, 758, to the angels and the unfallen worlds, the cry, quote, it is finished, end quote, had a deep significance. It was for them as well as for us that the great work of redemption had been accomplished. Not until the death of Christ was the character of Satan clearly revealed to the angels or to the unfallen worlds. The archapostate had so clothed himself with deception that even holy beings had not understood his principles. They had not clearly seen the nature of his rebellion. Wow. And remember that a third of the angels bought his arguments and went with him, and maybe there were, and I'm sure there were others who had questions. Ellen White suggested that many of the ones mm -hmm. that remained faithful said, well, I'm going to stay in God's camp, but I have questions. Yeah. And so, yeah. Well, here's, what we're, here's the, what we're trying to emphasize. The security of the universe was even more important to God <coughs> than the salvation of man. She wrote, it was in order that the heavenly universe might see the conditions of the covenant of redemption that Christ bore the penalty on behalf of the human race. The throne of justice must be eternally and forever made secure even though the race be wiped out. What race is he talking about? The human race. The human race. And another creation pop populate the earth. By the sacrifice Christ was about to make, all doubts would be forever settled, and the human race would be saved if they would return to their allegiance. Christ alone could restore honor to God's government. The cross of Calvary would be looked upon by the unfallen worlds, by the heavenly universe, by satanic agencies, by the fallen race, and every mouth would be stopped. In other words, as we're going to see, the, when it's all done, when the Grand Great Controversy comes to an end, nobody will be able to raise any questions about God's faithfulness, about His love, about His fairness. Every mouth will be stopped. Who is able to describe the last scenes of Christ's life on this earth, life on earth, His trial and the judgment, all His crucifixion? Who witnessed these scenes? The heavenly universe, God the Father, Satan and his angels. Wow. And who, is, who wasn't included in that group? Humans were not, inclu Humans. Were not included. None of us had a clue what was going on. As important as saving humans was, 
the purpose of Christ's life and death was far larger and more important than merely saving the inhabitants of this little planet. People, especially God's chosen people, had false concepts regarding the first coming of the Messiah. And what were some of those false concepts? The Messiah will come to be our earthly king to overthrow the Romans so that we can be top dog. And especially in the book of Zechariah, but some other places as well, there are, th there are things talked about, about he will, be a, he will be the king, he will come in glory and so forth like that. Those things we Christians now realize apply to his second coming. But the Jews wanted those things to happen in his first coming. So they had become confused by scripture. Not only did they want, but they thought that's what the Bible said. Yeah. Well, it did say it, but it was a different event than, yeah. than the first coming. So what are some of the false concepts taught today regarding the second coming of Jesus? Certainly we don't have any, do we? Oh, come on. We have it all straight. Millions of Christians have come to believe that if they once confess that they believe in Jesus Christ, they, became, they become so once saved, always saved. There are also strange and unusual ideas about how the final events of this world will play out. Some believe that Christ will return to this earth and reign from Jerusalem for a thousand years and that the whole world will embrace him. Are we ready for that? Well, there's some, some preachers who will go over to Jerusalem and try to start it. Yep. Well then, might the angels, and this is from Ellen White, well then might the angels rejoice as they looked upon the Savior's cross, for though they did not then understand all, they knew that the destruction of sin and Satan was forever made certain, that the redemption of man was assured, and that the universe was made eternally secure. So the universe was made eternally secure. Christ himself fully comprehended the results of the sacrifice made upon Calvary, to all these he looked forward when upon the cross he cried out, It is finished. Desire of Ages 764, par uh, paragraph 4. Jim, you want to take on that next one? Christ could have come down from the cross and saved himself. Assume he could here, it's a question. Yes, he was able not to, he was able but not willing to do so. His unconditional love for all humanity, including those mockers, did not allow him to give it up. To give up. Actually, the mockers were among those whom he was dying to save, and he could not come down from the cross and save himself because he was held not by the nails, but by his will to save them. This is from a fellow by the name of Alfred, Alfred Plummer in the Exegetical Commentary. Okay. You Here in the suffering of Christ, Jesus was defeating the kingdom of Satan, even though it was Satan who had instigated the events that led to the cross, including Judas' betrayal. What do we call that? That's a catch-22, right? Satan is trying to get Jesus, and he has to make it as difficult as possible for him so that he can maybe somehow or other get him to sin or something, maybe go back to heaven. But it and was no trickery on God's part. No, no. It was purely demonstration, education. He said, okay, if she that's what you what want to got. do, but we will, we will demonstrate the truth by what we do. Somehow, in a way, the evangelist does not try to describe the, the death of Jesus is both an act of Satan and an act in which Jesus wins the victory over Satan. George E. Ladd, Theology wow. of the New Testament. Amazing. Sins are based on lies, the first lies that Satan spoke to Adam and Eve and all the lies that he has propagated since then. This includes all the accusations and questions that he has raised about the character and government of God. But the solution to lies is telling the truth. The life and death of Jesus was the ultimate example of truth lived out. The scripture suggests that Jesus was the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. But animal sacrifices could never take away sins. How do we know that, Carrie? For the blood of bulls and goats can never take away sins. Every Jewish priest performed his services every day and offers the same sacrifices <coughs> many times. 
but these sacrifices can never take away sins. Okay, so let's talk about what that means. And that's from Hebrews 10. That's from Hebrews 10, verses 4 and 11. What Paul is really trying to say to us there is, if these sacrifices had really taken away sin and really taken, even our, taken away our desire to sin, then people would do what? They would stop sinning. But what happened? Later on he says, you know, all, this, all these sacrifices did is to remind us of our sins. So they, they didn't accomplish anything. We now know that, uh, we know that God's love is beyond comprehension, but notice these words again from Ellen White. But if one soul would have accepted the gospel. If of, but one soul. Yeah, if but one soul would have accepted the gospel of his grace, Christ would, to save that one, have chosen his life of toil and humiliation and his death of shame. That's incredible. Ministry of Healing, 135. But great God, in other words, God had to prove what needed to be proven even if only one human being accepted him. Gordon? From 1 Corinthians 1, 18 to 20, for the message about Christ's death on the cross is nonsense to those who are being lost, but for us who are being saved, it is God's power. The scripture says, quote, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and set aside the understanding of the scholars. So then, where does that leave the wise or the scholars or the skillful debaters of this world? God has shown that this world's wisdom is foolishness from the Good News Bible. Eternity can never fathom the depth, and this is from Stephen Haskell, one of the early founders of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Eternity can never fathom the depth of, depth of love revealed in the cross of Calvary. It was there that the infinite love of Christ and the unbounded selfishness of Satan stood face to face. There we have it, you see, face to face, love and selfishness. Let us be very clear, Jesus died not the first death, but the second death, which sinners will die in the end, separated from God by their sins, Isaiah 59, 2. Jim? First, the cross is a supreme revelation of God's justice against sin, Romans 3, 21 to 26. Second, the cross is the supreme revelation of God's love for sinners. Third, the cross is the great source of power to break the chains of sin. Fourth, the cross is our only hope of eternal life. Uh, and the fifth, the cross is the only antidote against the future rebellion in the re universe. From the Bible study guide for November 3rd. Okay, so how is the second death different from the first death with which we are so familiar? Carrie? Where are we here? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. After all has been done that God could do to save men, if they show by their lives that they slight Jesus, offered mercy, death will be their portion, and it will be dearly purchased. It will be a dreadful death, for they will have to feel the agony that Christ felt upon the cross to purchase for them the redemption which they have refused. And they will then realize what they have lost, eternal life and the immortal inheritance. Okay, Testimonies, Volume 1, 124. So what is that saying? The thing that killed Christ, his separation from the Father, is what sinners will realize and experience at the third coming, when that final judgment takes place. Okay? It's, it's just, again, um, something that I had not realized that those that had rejected Christ didn't feel a connection until this point when they realize that they are... Ellen White says in one place that his, his feelings of separation from his father was so terrible in his thinking that his physical pain was hardly felt. That's just But amazing. for the sinners to then understand that at this point. Uh, 
Yeah, do we feel pain when we commit sin? We should. We should, yeah. Okay, you want to read? Oh. Christ felt? Christ felt the anguish which the sinner will feel when mercy shall no longer plead for the guilty race. It was the sense of sin bringing the Father's wrath upon him as man's substitute that made him made the cup he drank so bitter and broke the heart of the Son of God. So it was his sense of separation from his yeah. father that killed him. From okay. Desire of Ages 753. Mm. And then from Desire of Ages 693, but God suffered with his son. Angels beheld the Savior's agony. They saw their Lord enclosed by legions of satanic forces, his nature weighed down with a shuddering, mysterious dread. There was silence in heaven. No harp was touched. In other words, all the attention of everyone, was, all the beings was there. They weren't... They were in, like, everybody was focused on, or, on what was happening to Jesus right there on the cross. <laughs> and what was the shuddering dread that he felt? He feared that his separation from the Father was to be eternal. He feared that his separation from his, from his Father was to be eternal. Again, no harp was touched. Could mortals have viewed the amazement of the angelic host as in silent grief they watched the Father separating his beams of light, love, and glory from his beloved Son, they would better understand how offensive in his sight is sin. Again, Desire of Ages, 693. Wow. And then again, Desire of Ages, 756 this time. Amid the awful darkness, apparently forsaken of God, Christ has drained the last dregs in the cup of human woe. Remember what did he say? My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? In those dreadful hours, he had relied upon the evidence of his Father's acceptance heretofore given him. He knew God. He was acquainted with the character of his Father. He understood his justice, his mercy, and his great love. By faith he rested in him whom it had ever been his joy to obey. And as in submission he committed himself to God, the sense of the loss of his Father's favor was withdrawn. In other words, he said, I can't feel my Father's presence right now, but I know he's there. I know he's there. I know what kind of a person he is, he would not leave me to die. And by faith, Christ was victor. Desire of Ages 756. Jim? Satan told that his disguise was torn away. His administration was laid open before the unfallen angels and before the heavenly throne. He had revealed himself as a murderer. By shedding the blood of the Son of God, he had uprooted himself from the sympathies of the heavenly beings. Henceforth, his work was restricted. Whatever attitude he might assume, he could no longer await the angels as they came from the heavenly courts, and before them accused Christ's brethren of being clothed with the garments of blackness and, uh, and the defilement of sin. The last link of sympathy between Satan and the heavenly world was broken. Yet Satan was not yet then destroyed. The angels did not even then understand all that was involved in the great controversy. The principles at stake were to be more fully revealed, and for the sake of man, Satan's existence must continue. Man, as well as angels, must see and the contrast between the Prince of Light and the Prince of Darkness. He, humans, must choose whom he will serve. In the opening of the great controversy, Satan had declared that the law of God could not be obeyed that justice was inconsistent with mercy, and that should the law be broken, it would be impossible for the sinner to be pardoned. Every sin must, be, must meet its punishment, urged Satan, and if God should remit the punishment of sin, he would not be a God of truth and justice. When men broke the law of God and defied his will, Satan exulted. It was proved, he declared, that the law could not be obeyed. Man could not be forgiven because he, after his rebellion, had been banished from heaven. Satan claimed that the human race must be forever shut out from God's favor. God could not be just. 
he urged and yet show mercy to the sinner. I wonder, so, was any act, by the way, that's a Desire of Ages 764, but was 761. God... 761. 761. Uh, Paragraphs 2 to 4. But would, did God banish him, or did the rest of the angels don't want him around? He yeah. really had nothing to offer uh, yeah. in that so, environment. Well, by, by the time of Jesus' death, the beings of the rest of the universe re understood the character of Satan much better yep. and they said, I don't want to have anything to do with you, Satan. I'm not going to listen to you anymore. Get away from me. Yep. And they ignored him from that point on. Yep. But prior to that, you'd had the, the, the heavenly council with, with Job and uh, first, well, excuse me, first Kings 22 and uh, Psalms 82. So the, the heavenly council has gotten together and, and and before. But if we looked at all the rest of the statements that Alan White makes about this, Satan was actually hoping that God would take the rest of the universe away and just leave this earth to him. Mm -hmm. he, want, he wanted this to be his domain. God, just, just leave this earth to me. M me and my people will live here. Maybe he was spent too much time in Disneyland, <laughs> Fantasyland. <laughs> Yeah, he was in fantasy land, that's for sure. I mean, people spend lots and lots of money for fantasy, don't they? Oh, yeah. Does this raise any questions in your mind? If Christ died for the sins of the whole world, why shouldn't everyone be saved? What does our personal choice and behavior have to do with our salvation? God would love to save everyone, even the devil. However, he cannot admit to heaven anyone who would just restart the great controversy. He can only save those whom he knows would be safe to live next door to for the rest of eternity. In several passages, Paul describes the wisdom of the world as foolishness. Is there any foolishness in the wisdom of our world today? What just, about the... Just huh? a bit. Just a bit? What about the ideas that the incredible design and beauty of our world are purely the chances of evolution? Or perhaps that the universe, all billions of galaxies, started from absolute nothingness and a big bang. What other examples can you think of? And there's a book that talks a little bit about this. It would be very interesting if you choose to read it, entitled, Is Atheism Dead? Written by Eric Metaxas, M-E-T-A-X-E-S. So is that the, in opposition to is God is dead yes. statements. Yes. Jesus died to demonstrate the serious results of sin, the death that we call the second death. But he was able to rise on the third day because he was sinless and divine. If we were to die that death, it would be final for us. That is why we say that he died for us. So there's another sense in which he died, so we don't have to die. Without that demonstration of the truth about God, his government and character, the whole universe would be at risk for accepting some or all of Satan's lies and ultimately would destroy itself since, Satan, since sin is ultimately self-destructive. How much is comprehended by the idea that Christ died for our sins? When we say that Christ died for our sins, we are saying that Christ died the second death which is what sin will do to every sinner who refuses to abandon his sin, Romans 6.23. Shouldn't the study of the death of Jesus convince us that we do not want to die that death? I hope so. Look at this brief summary from the Bible study guide about why Jesus came. Of course, it is very brief and leaves out many other reasons. I guess, Carrie, Carrie. Carrie that's yours. To redeem humanity, he was born as a man in order to die for us. To reveal to us the true loving character of God. To defeat Satan and refute his false claims. And to prove that the first Adam could have obeyed God as Christ in his humanity fulfilled perfectly all the law and lived a sinless holy life. Yeah, from our Bible study guide. Just think how marvelous it would be if none of us had ever sinned. We were all still living in the Garden of Eden. Wow. The Old Testament talks about the coming of Christ giving someday, so, I'm sorry, some very interesting poetic descriptions. The Bible study guide gives this. 
In the book of Isaiah, there are five songs regarding the servant of the Lord that are recognized by scholars. In Isaiah uh, chapter 42 what? through chapter 61, these poems present the work of Jesus Christ. He began his public ministry with the passage from Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2, which speaks about his mission. How, however, the best and the most elaborate exposition on the meaning of Christ's death in the Bible is Isaiah 53. For a different opinion, see item number 30 in this yeah, study guide of ours. We've already suggested we're going to give two different sort of opinions yeah. about how uh, these things are described, okay? Yeah. Which follows in the next section. Um, we're on number 28 now. Um, I've lost my place here. And follow uh, the core song of the suffering servant, which is starts in Isaiah 52. You want to? Okay. So first of all, Isaiah 52, 13 to 15, and that's what? The riddle. Okay. The song begins with a riddle because the servant is wise and highly exalted on the one hand, but on the other hand he is disfigured, abhorred by others, and marred. Two is from Isaiah 53, 1 to 3, the rejection. These verses point to the servant's total humiliation. He suffered, <clears throat> was despised, rejected, and became a man of sorrows. Third is Isaiah 53, 4 through 6, the atonement. This segment is the core of the matter wherein the reason is given for all Christ's suffering and death. For he took up our pain, bore our suffering, was pierced for our transgressions, and crushed for our iniquities. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. However, <coughs> however we need to keep in mind uh, Isaiah 54, 4, which says, all the while we thought that his suffering was punishment sent by God suggesting that it really wasn't sent by God, it was, we just thought it was. So what's, what was the suffering from? From sin, right? Yes. Yeah. Point number four, Isaiah 53, seven through nine, his submission. These texts describe Christ's suffering, trial, death, and burial. And five, Isaiah 53, 10 through 12, his exaltation. The song culminates with the resurrection of the one who was a guilt offering, and his prosperity and victory. He justified many because, quote, he bore the sin of many, end quote. And there's reference given, and shared his, his spoil with them. His death was voluntary, substitutionary, and atoning. Afterwards, the results of his triumphant death are applied to believers in his intercessional ministry for them. A the lot Teacher's of Bible study guide, a lot yeah. of forensic talk. A lot of forensic talk, complicated language there. But basically, as we've suggested, Jesus had to come, answer the questions, deal with the accusations, demonstrate the truth. And when that's done, he knows that ultimately sin will be completely eliminated and the universe will be safe once again. That's what we're talking about. Only one verse in the Bible specifically attempts to explain why Jesus had to die. That is found in Romans 3, 25 and 26. God offered him so that by his blood, that is by his sacrificial death, he should become the means by which people's sins are forgiven through their faith in him. Okay, now how does that happen? God did this in order to demonstrate that he is righteous. In other words, in order to understand the, to answer the questions and the accusations against God, what do you have to do? You have to tell the truth about God, right? In the past, he was patient and overlooked people's sins. And of course, that's the story of, from the days of Adam and Eve, isn't it? But in the present time, he deals with their sins in order to demonstrate his righteousness. There's a second time to demonstrate his righteousness. In this way, God shows that he himself is righteous. That's the third time and that he puts right er, the, uh, everyone who believes in him. So in order to solve the issues in the great controversy, in order to take that larger, bigger picture of what's going on in the universe, God has to demonstrate his righteousness because when it's all done and said, what, what, what needs to happen? We all need to love and trust God and love and trust each other. That's the way God's government works. 
It is very significant to notice that Romans 3, 25 and 26 mentions three times that God sent Jesus in order to demonstrate that he is righteous. He overlooked people's sins, but he is still demonstrating his righteousness. In this way, God shows that he himself is righteous. Three times Paul mentioned that God has demonstrated his own righteousness before he talked about, talked about people being put right if they believe in Jesus. And we want to focus about, oh no, God's here to put us right, right? Isn't that what he's here for? Well, no, he's, he's here to set things right in the whole great controversy issue. And when that happens, then it's possible for us to be saved. He's here to show us the truth about God, mm -hmm. what God is really like. After describing all that Christ has done for us and describing various aspects of his life, Paul wrote, I think that should be Jim. Galatians 2, 16 to 21, or 16 and 21, excuse me. Yet we know that the person is put right with God only through faith in Jesus Christ, never by doing what the law requires. We too have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be put right with God through our faith in Christ, and not by doing what the law requires. For no one is put right with God by doing what the law requires. I refuse to reject the grace of God, but if a person is put right with God through the law, it means that Christ died for nothing, good news Bible. In other words, if there's some other way to accomplish what needed to be done, God, Jesus need not have come, but obviously there wasn't. Carrie? When Christ returned to heaven, there was rejoicing everywhere. When the Father beheld the sacrifice of His Son, He bowed before it in recognition of His perfection. It is enough, He said, the atonement is complete. That's from Mrs. White's writings of Advent Review of Sabbath Herald. Yeah. Wow. In other words, God says, what was done, what was accomplished, when the universe looks on, everybody, including sinners at the final end, will say, it was enough. It was good. An interesting way to so describe what was accomplished by the life and death of Jesus is to call it cosmic stability. What do we mean by that? The entire universe is safe for all eternity because of what God accomplished through the life and death of Jesus. That's spelled out in Ephesians 1, 7 and 9, 3, 7 and 9, and Colossians 1, 19 and 20. And right there, if we had time to read all those verses, it would say that we are a part of demonstrating the truth about God. Angels would learn something about God from us. How could the angels learn something about God from us? Philippians 2, 9 to 11. For this reason, God raised him to the highest place above and gave him the name that was greater than any other name. And so in honor of the name of Jesus, all beings in heaven, on earth, and in the world below fell to their knees, and all will openly proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord, the glory of, the, of God the Father. Okay, so when it says all beings in heaven, on earth, and the world below, how many does that include? It's just about everybody. Everybody. Humans and angelic hosts. Even including Satan, Satan himself. Yeah. That's the important yeah. thing. Exactly. There will be no one left with any valid questions against God when that is accomplished. Gordon? From Ellen White. Not only man, but angels will ascribe honor and glory to the Redeemer, for even they are secure only through the sufferings of the Son of God. It is through the efficacy of the cross that the inhabitants of unfallen worlds have been guarded from apostasy. It is this that has effectually, un effectually unveiled the deceptions of Satan and refuted his claims. Not only those that are washed by the blood of Christ, but also the holy angels are drawn to him by his crowning act of giving his life for the sins of the world. From wow. Bible Training School and part from Home Missionary. So once again, we've seen many, many statements here basically saying the same thing, that Jesus came to do something for the benefit of the entire universe. He had to 
establish the perpetuity and strength of God's government. The angels ascribe honor and glory to, God, to Christ, for even they are not secure except by looking to the sufferings of Son of God. Let me stop for a second. Why would that be true? Why wouldn't the angels be secure? Well, angelic perfection failed in heaven. Yep. And human humans failed on in perfect Eden. That's Why what did it, that happen? Why did all that? Why happen? did a third of the angels believe Satan? Mm -hmm. Good question. God is love. Yeah. People have the creature, intelligent creatures have the capacity to make a choice. Yeah. That's why there is evil. In order, in order for there to be love, there has to be freedom. Exactly. Freedom means that there's choices, right? Yep. It is through the efficacy of the cross that the angels of heaven are guarded from apostasy. Without the cross, they, that is the angels, would be no more secure against evil than were the angels before the fall of Satan. Angelic perfection failed in heaven. Human perfection failed on, in Eden, the paradise of bliss. All who wish for security in earth or heaven must look to the Lamb of God. The plan of salvation, making manifest the justice and love of God, provides an eternal safeguard. How long is this safeguard going to be effective? Eternal. For eternity. For eternity. Against the defection in unfallen worlds, as well as among those who shall be redeemed, by the blood of the Lamb. That's, Ellen White wrote that in 1889, Signs of the Times. Did, uh, Jim, you want me to read, read the next one there? When Christ cried out, it is finished, the unfallen worlds were made secure. For them the battle was fought and the victory won. Henceforth Satan had no place in the affections of the universe. The argument he had brought forward that self-denial was impossible with God and therefore unjustly required from his created intelligence was forever answered. Satan's claims were forever set aside. The heavenly universe was secured in eternal allegiance. Ellen White, Advent Review, March 12, 1901. Okay, we will spend the rest of eternity studying the plan of salvation, specifically the cross and all that that implies. To understand it in the larger context of the great controversy is an amazing mystery. If we will ever fully, will we ever fully comprehend it? Shouldn't we beginning, begin doing all we possibly can to understand it today? And that has been the purpose of our discussion today. We hope that you have found that enlightening and that you will look at these passages that we have been studying. Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, it's a great blessing that we have this information to straighten us out, to give us the clear information, and to at least give us a hint of what things we'll be studying for the rest of eternity. May that be our experience is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.